Item number, SCP-7242. Object class, neutralized. Special containment procedures. SCP-7242 no longer appears to be a threat. Any recovered information regarding SCP-7242 is to be kept in the archives for review. These files should be updated if further information becomes available. Beyond keeping a record, no further containment procedures can be applied. Should the wreckage of K-122 be found, it is to be immediately investigated by a mobile task force and searched for any signs of anomalous activity. Implementation of containment procedures will depend on findings. Description SCP-7242 was a November-class submarine constructed in 1963 under the designation K-122. According to photographs, documentation, as well as maintenance and construction logs, there were no discernible differences between SCP-7242 and other contemporary submarines of the same model. The precise nature of the anomaly is unclear. Declassified GRU-P records have offered some insight, as well as the testimony of First Officer Vasily Kestrov. Of course, these accounts are limited to what was known by all involved. The following details have been extrapolated from the available accounts. SCP-7242 appears to be connected to the submarine K-122. SCP-7242 produced a mimetic effect which could affect the minds of its crew. This often resulted in visual and auditory hallucinations. It could also alter a person's memories and manipulate them. SCP-7242 had, at most, an extremely limited hold over K-122's systems. All machines aboard K-122 appear to function as normal and can be operated independently of its influence. Although unconfirmed, it is possible that the anomaly's effects were only triggered while submerged. However, a series of incidents led K-122 to develop a reputation for being cursed, although information regarding the full extent of its anomalous nature was expunged from Soviet records. It is known that several workers were injured or killed during K-122's construction. This was often caused by sudden accidents, many of which they insisted should have been impossible. Some members of the workforce reported hearing voices or experiencing hallucinations. Despite these strange occurrences, these complaints were initially dismissed as superstition by the Soviet Navy, and the troubled production was covered up. During its launch, a champagne bottle was swung at K-122, which failed to break. K-122 was put under the command of Dmitry Taraskovich, a decorated Soviet captain. Taraskovich then used his position to recruit an old friend, Vasily Kestrov, as his first officer. K-122 first left on June 30th, 1963, for a three-month patrol of the Atlantic. Addendum Kestrov's Diary June 31st, 1963 We've entered open water. Current instructions are to proceed into the North Atlantic. It's a strange feeling. A week ago, I was just another soldier in the Naval Infantry, but Taraskovich, I guess he wanted someone he could trust. He pulled a few strings to get me transferred to this position. Seems hard to believe, but I suppose I'm doing my family proud. My family has a long naval tradition. My grandfather was aboard Potemkin. I always knew this was gonna happen someday, but to actually see it happen. Taraskovich did a lot to prepare me for this moment. All those years sailing with him up and down the Moscow River are proving to be very useful. The hard part is the tight environment. It's so narrow and you're surrounded on all sides. I admit, I miss the salty air of the surface, but I knew what I signed up for when I took this position. Being trapped in a tin can with 105 men can be rough, but being underwater is kind of exciting in a way. We're in deep. Not many people can say they've been where we have. Of course, that would be a bit more exciting if I could actually see some of the ocean around me. If only we could have portholes. And it's easy to forget just how vast the ocean is when your days are spent with over a hundred men in a metal tube. It feels like there's more men aboard than when we left. I keep seeing faces I don't recognize, hearing names I don't remember seeing on the manifest. Sometimes it feels like crew members show up out of nowhere. But we have a lot of people on this boat. I'll have an easier time keeping track once we've spent more time together. July 2nd, 1963. So far, K-122 has performed admirably. We surfaced in the northern Atlantic at the coordinate 75 degrees 28 seconds north, 24 degrees 42 minutes 48.4 seconds east. 
Taraskovich said he was proud of the crew. At dinner, he brought out a bottle of champagne to share with the officers. He made a choking remark about how he'd replace all of K-122's provisions with champagne if Khrushchev would allow it. But he didn't want to deny the crew any sort of reward for their hard work. We couldn't carry enough alcohol to give the entire crew, so Taraskovich had a slightly different idea. He managed to bring a record player on board, though I have no idea how. He treated it as a gift for the crew to enjoy. He also went one better, provided them with several records, mostly classical composers. They've been very excited. Morale seems to have gone up, and I think they enjoy listening to it while they work. July 4th, 1963. Taraskovich received new orders from command. We are expected to change course to the coordinates 43 degrees 55 minutes 19.9 seconds north, 59 degrees 30 minutes 30.3 seconds west. I checked out maps. That places us off the coast of Nova Scotia. That's on the other side of the Atlantic. It seems strange that we'd be asked to deploy there, but Taraskovich refused to say why. He only said that it was from the Kremlin, and that information was on a need-to-know basis. I hate to doubt the motherland, but why are we heading towards Canada? I know we're not on the best of terms, but I don't think they pose a significant threat. Do they even have nuclear missiles? There was that incident with the airplane, but they're just caught in the crossfire. Surely the Kremlin doesn't hold a grudge against Canada for wanting to avoid mutually assured destruction. Something about this mission feels… wrong. Nothing's adding up, but Taraskovich seems to know what he's doing. Hopefully this will all make sense eventually. July 5th, 1963. Melnik came down with a sudden fever. Dr. Sobel is doing his best, but we're not sure what happened. He was fine yesterday, but this morning he suddenly collapsed. He's been claiming to see outside, into the water. This shouldn't be possible. We don't even have portholes. Has he somehow managed to hallucinate windows? I don't claim to understand what's going on in his mind, but it's got him worried. I tried talking to Taraskovich. He seemed indifferent, insisting Melnik's condition wasn't an issue. He told us to keep him isolated. It was hard to imagine this being the same man who gave them all vodka just a couple days ago. July 6, 1963. Despite Sobel's efforts, the fever seems to be spreading. Now Petrov's sick. The symptoms seem to be the same, but what I find more disturbing is what he's saying. He's claiming to hear voices from outside, as if someone's speaking to him from the ocean. That's impossible, isn't it? But he also claims to have seen glimpses of the outside, and supposedly seen bodies floating in the water. It sounds a lot like Melnik's hallucinations. I can't help feeling worried. Surely there has to be a rational explanation for all this. Maybe Petrov just overheard Melnik and is stuck in his mind. I know there has to be a logical explanation, but there's a small part of me, like a voice in the back of my mind, that just can't shake the thought that they're right and something really is out there. Taraskovich seems to be under a lot of pressure to finish the mission. He yelled at Sobel, demanding he do his job and cure Melnik and Petrov. I've known Taraskovich for 20 years. He's never once shouted at anyone like that. Whatever command wants from us, it's already taken its toll on him. July 7th, 1963. I couldn't sleep last night. I thought I heard something. It almost sounded like a voice whispering into my ear, except I couldn't make out anything it was saying. Then it disappeared as soon as it happened. Then Dr. Sobel arrived at my cabin and told me Melnik and Petrov had disappeared from the med bay. I tried getting the crew to help, but Taraskovich kept overturning my orders. Everyone I tried to ask for help, he kept telling to return to their duties, like he didn't care about the missing crew members. We found Petrov's body in the torpedo bay. I don't know how he did it, but he somehow managed to steal a pistol from one of the officers and shot himself. We couldn't find Melnik anywhere. How is that possible? He couldn't have jumped overboard. How many places can a person hide on a submarine while it's underwater? Unless… No, that can't be right. Could Melnik have put himself into a torpedo tube? Something is wrong here. I don't know what's happening, but the further we go, the more I start to think we're caught in the middle of something. 
July 8th, 1963. Taraskovich ordered us to increase speed by 30 knots. Then he called me into his quarters. I found him sitting with a bottle of vodka, glass already poured. He handed the bottle to me. Then he revealed something shocking, something I'm not allowed to tell anyone. The orders he received. I suspected there was something going on, but I didn't think it would be this. It's finally happened. We all knew it was a possibility, but we secretly hoped it would never happen. Apparently America has launched a nuclear missile directly at the Kremlin. Moscow's an irradiated wasteland. Our orders were to launch our missiles at the United States. I can't believe it. It feels so surreal, but there's another part that still bothers me. Why are we moving towards Canada? Taraskovich insists it's the best launch point, but it doesn't make sense to me. We'd be better off approaching the American coastline, would we not? Whatever his reasons, this situation got a whole lot worse. I never thought I'd live to see this day. July 10th, 1963. We struck something. It all happened so suddenly. One moment everything was fine. The next, I heard us crash into something. The whole submarine seemed to shake beneath our feet. I was thrown to the ground. Sobel had to treat several men for injuries. It appeared we hit a mountain. Taraskovich was furious. He blamed me for it. He started calling me incompetent and accused me of being ungrateful for getting me the first officer position. The only problem was, I checked our maps. As far as I could tell, we did everything right. There shouldn't have been a mountain there. At our present coordinates, there should have been nothing more than open water. So how did we hit a mountain? Or did we hit something else? And if so, what? We've all been on edge. I hoped this would all make sense, but the further we get into this mess, the more confusing it seems to get. Taraskovich didn't want me telling the men that their homes may have already been destroyed. By now, there may be nothing left of Russia, but it seems hard to believe down here. If the situation was as bad as Taraskovich said, surely we would have begun to feel its effects by now. There's been no sign of radiation outside our reactor. The water currents seem perfectly normal. Maybe we're a little too deep? I don't know. July 11th, 1963. Luckily, we're still functional, despite the damage. We managed to avoid a hull breach, but I don't think we should be taking any more chances. We lost Tchaikovsky. He received a concussion when we hit the mountain. Sobel pronounced him dead this morning. Three more are in critical condition and medical supplies are limited. The crew are getting restless. Several have come to me to voice their frustration over Taraskovich. I fear I may have to choose between my captain or my crew. But there doesn't seem to be much left of Taraskovich in there. I'd like to find some way to end this without bloodshed, but that's starting to look impossible. July 12th, 1963. I was on the bridge when Orlov approached. He asked if I could talk privately. I met with him in my quarters and he told me the crew had been scared. Everyone feels like they're going to die and Taraskovich is refusing to listen. He mentioned being afraid of what would happen and a sense that there was something very wrong. He claimed to feel like there was something outside, watching us. After the last few days, it didn't seem hard to believe. He finally admitted that the crew had been talking about trying to relieve Taraskovich of his command. Much as I hated to admit it, he was too far gone. This mission was costing too much. I won't claim to like it, but it's time to act. We're going to confront Taraskovich. I doubt he'll see reason, but perhaps we can restrain him until we get back to the motherland. Maybe whatever has gotten into his mind will lose its grip and he'll eventually thank us. July 13th, 1963. I'm writing this in the dark by flashlight. It looks like we're going to die down here. We're sinking. I'm not sure how deep we are, but I can feel us going down. If the worst should happen, I intend to place this journal in a watertight container and release it into the ocean. That way I can at least ensure there's a record of what happened down here, assuming anyone's left to read it. Orlov approached Taraskovich, explaining the feelings of the crew and their decision to relieve him of command. Taraskovich shot him on the spot. Next thing I knew, the rest of the crew was mutinying. Taraskovich shot at least five more men before he turned to me. He called me a traitor, pointed his gun at my head. I just 
stood there. All of my life, I'd known this man. I never thought he would turn on me like this. Before he could fire, the lights went out. I ran. I didn't care where. I just had to get away from Taraskovich. I tried to feel the bulkheads around me, looking for the doors. I finally ran into Zima, who gave me a flashlight. That was when I started to realize what had happened. It wasn't just dark. It was silent. I found a few more of the men, all of them scared and confused. It looked like every system on the ship was dead. I found Kavalichuk in the engine room. I'd hoped he'd know how to fix the engines, but that was where things got even worse. He told me that he's been checking everything, but can't find anything wrong. I helped him inspect the reactor. It was in perfect condition, not even a crack. Nothing seemed to be broken. Every system aboard had just shut down at the same time. When I finally had the nerve to go back to the bridge, I found Taraskovich staring through the periscope. I don't know what he expected to see at this depth, but he seemed to be fixated on something. I only ever wanted to make my family proud. I wish I could have been the son you wanted. July 14th, 1963. The lights are still out. We're trapped in darkness, and our options seem hopeless. We can't even get the toilet to work, but nobody can find any mechanical fault. We might be able to ration food, but I doubt our air is going to last much longer if we can't get the filtration running. The air is growing stale. I've seen more men bedridden, and a few have already died. We can't do anything with their bodies, so now we have the stench coming through as well. But there's something about this darkness that doesn't feel natural. It's not just that we don't have light, it's somehow able to absorb the light from our flashlights. I can't light any further than right in front of me. I've also been noticing that navigating is becoming difficult. Too many of us are getting lost trying to move around. The doors aren't lining up. I tried to reach the engine room and found myself in the galley. When I turned back the way I came, I was in the torpedo bay. I haven't been able to find Taraskovich. He was on the bridge when the lights went out, but I can't seem to reach it. I've tried several times, but every attempt to enter kept taking me to a different room. It's like something's changing the layout to redirect us. How is that possible? I'll prepare the container for this journal. If we get no results in the next 24 hours, I'll release it into the ocean. July 15th, 1963. If ever there was such a thing as a miracle, I think we've just experienced it. I don't know how, but everything started working again. The lights suddenly came back on, and the engine started running. Everything seems to be working again as if the blackout we experienced for the last two days never happened. The relief seems to have made it a little quieter, but I worry it's only a temporary calm between storms. I'm relieved we may have a chance to escape this nightmare, but Taraskovich has ordered us to keep going. I wanted to resurface. I don't know how much more K-122 can take. At this point, I wonder if we're not better off taking our chances in whatever radioactive wasteland the world above has become. But he wouldn't listen. Instead, he told me I was relieved of command and ordered me confined to my quarters. Nobody has upheld that order, but I have a feeling it's only a matter of time before they revolt again. July 16th, 1963. It finally happened. Everything's gone wrong. I can't claim to be proud of what I did, but someone had to act. Someone had to end the madness. Captain Taraskovich is dead. The man I looked up to, who taught me how to sail, his blood is on my hands but I still can't help feeling as though he was already dead. The man I saw in those final moments was not the man who took me sailing on the Moscow River. We detected an American destroyer on the surface, but I noticed something strange. We charted its movements. It seemed to be on a regular patrol route, like nothing was happening on the surface. Now I'm faced with a shocking conclusion. Taraskovich lied. There is no war happening above us. But why would he do that? The men were getting desperate. It was the first sign of anyone who could help us. They didn't care if they were our enemies. Zima begged Taraskovich to surrender to them. He called Zima a coward and a traitor to the motherland. I tried to step in, but he just shoved me aside, told me a traitor needed to be punished appropriately. I managed to grab him and wrestle his gun out of his hand, and that was enough time for Zima to run. But it wasn't over yet. Not long after, Taraskovich called everyone to the torpedo bay. When I arrived, I saw him holding Zima. 
Apparently in an act of desperation, Zima tried to contact the American ship and was caught in the act. Taraskovich claimed he was a spy, giving the Americans important secrets. But I won't forget what I saw him do next. He claimed to be making an example of Zima. He ordered us to watch as he opened the torpedo tube and shoved the poor kid inside, then sealed it. Then he activated the launch sequence. In that moment, something changed. I knew I had to do something. Someone had to stop the madness. I saw a wrench, and suddenly a sense of rage overcame me. I waited until the captain's back was turned and approached him. I swung the wrench with a strength I didn't know I had, right into his head. It was only when I saw his body that I fully realized what I'd done. I didn't want to kill him, but how else was I to end this nightmare? With Taraskovich gone, I was now in command, and I could order the crew to surface. I went to the bridge and started giving the orders. We put everything we had into upward movement. The crew worked harder than I'd ever seen them since we left. July 17th, 1963. Finally some quiet. We've been on the surface for a day. I don't want to take any chances under the water, but everything seems to be in working order. Perhaps a dry dock inspection will reveal more about what's been happening to us. For now, we're just glad to be alive. I'm writing this on the deck, with a cool breeze and fresh air. I didn't think I'd experience either again when the power went out. We laid the bodies of our fallen crew to rest. They've been given a sailor's burial. I couldn't watch as they put Taraskovich into the water. I still can't believe he's gone. We sent out a distress call, and our remaining supply should last until we're rescued. For now, I think the crew's earned about as much of a break as I can offer them. I've asked no further duties of them. I know there are going to be questions about Taraskovich's fate. I'll do my best to answer them. I doubt anyone will believe me, but what else am I going to say? For now, I just like to enjoy the calm waves, but I wouldn't mind a shower when we get back. I don't know what we experienced down there. I'll probably never know for sure. My imagination runs wild with speculation. I find myself picturing sea monsters from old legends. Maybe that's what we crashed into. Whatever it was, it no longer seems to be affecting us. But it must be out there, somewhere. Addendum, GRU-P case file. After the remaining crew were rescued, Kestrov claimed responsibility for the death of Taraskovich. This act briefly resulted in a KGB investigation, during which Kestrov attempted to tell his account of events. Kestrov's description of anomalous occurrences was initially dismissed by the KGB, who were prepared to charge him with anti-Soviet activity for murdering a decorated officer. However, Kestrov was quietly exonerated after his account reached GRU-P officer Sergei Voronin. The following is a part of the official GRU-P report that was declassified in 1991. OSI K-122 Approved 16-7-1963 Signed S. Responsible Personnel Sergei Voronin Department Head Captain Boris Medved Detail K-122 is the designation of a November-class submarine deployed for a three-month patrol on June 30, 1963. On July 14, 1963, K-122 was found adrift at sea with several of its crew members, including Captain Dmitry Taraskovich, dead. First Officer Vasily Kestrov described multiple strange occurrences aboard K-122. Interviews with members of his crew have presented similar accounts. See attached diary. The incident involving K-122 has resulted in blame falling upon First Officer Kestrov. However, after reviewing the available evidence, I have noticed that some details of his account do not line up. Nothing in Kestrov's record provides any logical motive to kill Taraskovich. In fact, it appears he had every reason not to. I have spoken to Kestrov and collected his testimony. His account lines up with what was described and dismissed by the KGB reports, but I have noticed a few peculiarities. He claims that Taraskovich received orders to fire missiles off the coast of Nova Scotia. However, my investigation has found Captain Taraskovich was explicitly ordered to maintain radio silence for the duration of the voyage, and I have found no records indicating this rule was broken in any way. I would like to investigate this matter further. It is possible Kestrov either discovered an aquatic anomaly or there is something anomalous about the submarine. If this is true, it could pose further danger to our fleet. We must identify it. 
Recommended procedure. K-122 should not be redeployed for naval use until its anomalous properties, if any, have been properly understood. Recommend K-122 be brought to a secure facility under the guise of being decommissioned due to damage sustained. Surviving crew members may be released after further questioning. Encourage them to spread a rumor about a curse affecting the submarine. Official records indicate K-122 was decommissioned due to damage sustained on its initial voyage. In actuality, GRU-P had it brought to an undisclosed dry dock for further research. The results of GRU-P's research appears to have been expunged from all known records. The final location and ultimate fate of K-122 remains unknown. Thank you all so much for watching, and a huge thank you to all of my patrons on Patreon. Special shout out to Everborn, Joe Light, The Bone Man, Tannis Ruler of All, and Doomsday LLC, Prince and Design. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash drmaxwell. Link in the description.